about that bio is my mom wrote it. I mean, my goodness. I do I live up to all of that? That's crazy. I've got two kids and everything else. I mean, that's... I've got a clicker, so left side, right side? Right. Right side, okay. So to start everything off, we're gonna go pretty quickly here because we're a little bit behind time. I'm between uh, the you and lunch at this point and the uh, floor with all of mine. And I wanna get there as well. So we're gonna start off by talking about Imagine. Imagine what it would be like that if we sold everything that we made. But not just sold everything we made, because I do work for some wineries now that that's, that's not the problem. But if it's sold at the right price point, sold the right way, sold by the right person, sold without the discounting that we have to do sometimes, sold to the right places, and um, presented in the right way, what an incredible world that would be. How many people here could say that that happens all the time to their brain? I mean, there's very, very rarely, very little, not very often do I see a winery that absolutely can achieve that imagination. But we're here to talk about how we can get close to that, how we can achieve that, how we can get to that imagination. So a little bit about my background. You heard some of it already, and we don't have to go through it again, because again, my mom loves this slide, and I've talked about my mom quite a bit. Is it okay for a Yankee fan to come up out there a Boston Red Sox fan? Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay, thank you, that's cool. Um, but my mom's from uh, Long Island, and she's, if you call my mom on the phone, she's got that Long Island accent, she's like, oh, hi, honey, how you doing? And I always know that it's gonna be a long talk because she had to hear her smoking on the phone, and now she bangs on the phone, right? Or I could hear the Chardonnay, you know, as she swirls it, because I taught her how to swirl it, but she puts ice in the glass, and I could hear the ting, ting, ting as it goes around, it just kills me. Especially when I send her very expensive Chardonnays to the face, right? Um, but I told her, well, there was a day, you know, 15 years I've been in the business, before that I was in high tech, and I remember the day that I called her before any of this existed, and I said, hey mom, I got my first job in the wine business uh, at uh, Kendall Jackson. I take a chance on a guy from outside the industry, and she just, I heard her take a long puff at that. It was a, a cigarette at that point. And she goes, well, that's, that's good. That's really all you did pretty well in college. I said, now, if you have a Long Island-based mom, you kind of know what I'm talking about. It's that snarky, I think it was a compliment, but I'm not sure. And she goes, uh, I said, what the hell do you mean by that, Irene? She goes, uh, well, you know, listen, you, you drank a lot in college, so at least now you can go out and make money doing it. And so I think she's pretty proud of me, and I think that's a compliment. So I gotta continue to keep going up and up so she can put her ice in my, my, my St. Helena Cabernet. So one thing that's not on this slide, I mean, would be a little embarrassing if I had these brands up there, um, but are the failures. We've all had great successes, and of course I'm showing off with all these incredibly beautiful brands. Most of them were around well before me, massively successful, and due to partly because some of the people in this room that worked on these brands with me, but were the failures. There was a lot of brands that I managed that didn't work and that, that didn't resonate with the audience or didn't resonate with where we were selling it. Or it was an amazing brand with amazing wine, but it was just not sold the right way. So over these 15 years, I've had the unique opportunity to see these brands, the successes and the failures. You need the failures on your resume. Not that you're gonna put them up in front of a slide or in front of a couple hundred people. Um, maybe I should, but you need those failures to learn the things that I have learned and many of you have learned throughout the years. So making wine is very difficult, and my friend Travis, who's sitting right in front of me, who's a winemaker, and I didn't expect that many winemakers to be here, it's going to be a little difficult to say this in front of him, because he makes amazing wine, is it is very difficult. It's incredibly hard, from the St. Helena Mountains down to Temecula, to Oregon, Washington, Wherever you are, making wine is incredibly difficult, and we're never gonna minimize the artisan and the craft making of making wine. But until you head out on the road, until you get in an airplane in January or late February, and you have to go to Cincinnati for a 15 minute meeting with Kroger, and your head could literally explode at the table, and the guy in front of you will just be annoyed because you got his white shirt messed up. Or you're trying to get that one $50 by the glass at Mastro's because every, what, 10,000 Napa brands are trying to get that listing. It is one of the most soul-searching, gut-wrenching, difficult processes I've ever been involved with, you know? And I've been on all sides of the business, marketing, winemaking, productions, and now 
sales for quite some time, and it is an eye-opening process. And I would imagine that when you grow up, you want to go to UC Davis to become a winemaker, or an enologist, or a viticulturist. Not that many people say, you know, I want to go be the greatest damn salesperson in wine. And the reason why I know this is because when I managed properties like Mom Napa, and we would have reps come from around the country and visit us, right? They come to Mum, come to Rutherford, it's beautiful. Oh, and the faces light up, they meet the winemaker, they go to the vineyards, they drink the wine, and they're just, I mean, it's great. And then I have to go with that same sales rep to, uh, you know, Florida to try to get into Publix. The whole disposition changes. They're still great. I mean, I've worked with some of the greatest sales reps in the, in the, in the world, really, for wine sales. They're excellent at what they do. But in your heart, in your soul, it's hard to get up and get excited about selling wine when you're sitting in wherever, the heat of Oahu trying to get them into Foodland or ABC. So it is a difficult process. It takes a unique personality. But I also found that the greatest sales reps and the greatest selling companies still get it wrong, and they get it wrong often. It's really a fascinating. Until we get to that dream of selling every bottle exactly the way we want to, in the right places, with the right people, it is a very difficult process. So what I find, usually, even in the most sophisticated companies and non-sophisticated, that it's a really complex thought process of how they go about it. You know, especially when I join a new winery, it is, I mean, they put together plans and all this stuff, and I find at the end of the day, this happens. Things either go off the rails, all intentions don't happen, or they start off this way. They start off this way. And I thought maybe a field of dreams thing would be good here as well, right? If you build it, they will come. Not just a great wine, like in Fort Negotian, but a $20 million winery up in Howell Mountain. If you build it, they will come. Beautiful bottle, get 94 points, 98 points from whatever uh, you know, critic that they're interested in, whatever critic is revolving doors right now. And then nobody comes and buys the wine, or it doesn't get allocated the way they want it to. So it is typically a spaghetti thrown on the uh, wall process. Now, I do not like real, long, complex processes of thought. I mean, there's a lot of things in the wine business, and usually the cart is before the horse. We've got to get out and sell. Other brands are getting ahead of us. The gentleman that was before me, that is an amazing story. That guy is out there killing it, and I love that it was 90% <laughs> sales. I love that, that sales and marketing. He made the sales and marketing side as much of a rock star as the wine side. I love that. But we have, we have to get out and we have to do these things, but we still have to have go through a process before we do that. And so, at the risk of sounding like Stephen Covey, and I'm not as smart as he is, so I can only think of six steps. He, well, I think he did seven, right? So six steps, and I know they kind of seem a little marketing y but we're gonna go through each one. One of them, in the middle, we're gonna stop and we're gonna take a little time on, which is the commitment, the commitment portion. Now, please understand that I'm coming at this not just from the guy who sets the pace of the sales and marketing team, the executive of the, of the winery. I'm also coming at this from a minute, mostly from a minute. When I write these presentations and when I give, deliver these speeches, in my mind, I'm actually going back to the many times where I was the worker bee, and I was the, the guy on the street, or as the marketing director, or whatever role I was in, and I remember how I felt and my perception of things in these moments. So if there are owners in here, executives in here that set the tone, please, you know, if we can remember back to when, when we first started, a lot of these things are gonna apply to the people that uh, work for you, or work out in the market for you. Okay, so the first one, oh, quote unquote. So I get inspired by documentaries. If anybody's seen Chef's Table now on Netflix, it's amazing, or Hero Dreams of Sushi, or I just love these things. I love excellence. I love being around and being inspired by people that are just really brilliant minds and can do things at a high level. So we're gonna use some quotes here, kind of make things a little interesting over the next few slides. So the first one I mentioned is define, right? Start at the beginning. And I love this from Michael Jordan, right? I didn't come here to be average. So what is the purpose and goals? Now, this could be for a 500,000 case winery, a 10,000 case winery, or you haven't started yet, or you're just gonna start your negotiation brand and you haven't started the brand yet. This could be for everybody. And this is a process that you have to go through. And I know it sounds kind of like a little flippant. Yeah, I know my brand, man. I don't need to listen to this guy. It's, I know what I'm doing. We've been doing this for 10 years. You have to pause and you have to go back to the goals. You have to go back to why the brand existed in the first place. You cannot lose that DNA of the purpose. 
And because at the end of the day, we get busy. And if you look back at the way you, would, what you thought of your brand or your winery or whatever, whatever you started 10 years ago, 10 months ago, things change because the world kind of takes shape and the way it goes and we react to it. So you have to go back to the goals because this sets the tone for everything, not only the way you, whatever you write, whatever you put up on the screen, whatever you present, but also the way you talk about your brands and the way you talk about your wines. And I, we're gonna go through some examples here, but I love what Michael Jordan said. I've never heard anybody say, I come here just to be average. Yeah, we're gonna make a wine, we're gonna be kind of shitty at selling it, we're gonna probably be average, and maybe we'll discount it a lot, right? Nobody ever says that, though it kind of happens sometimes, right? Be excellent, strive for the top, go for it. Say we wanna be the greatest $15 rosé. We wanna blow the rosé category open and be the first $50 rosé that goes to 50,000 cases, whatever your goal is, and it can happen. Right? Brands have taught us that if you could put a foot on it, and everybody's going to buy a brand with a foot on it. After I look at them, who the hell's going to buy a brand with a foot on it? Right? It's millions of cases. Or a very, very expensive Pinot Noir that you can't pronounce the name. And that's just one of the biggest selling wines of all time. So you don't know where the next success is going to come from. So you have to think, and you have to be on the highest level. You have to think that you do. So some examples of of uh, starting at the big boutique versus volume. Are you, are, are, are you gonna wanna be small? Do you wanna be big? You wanna stack it high, stack it deep? Or do you wanna just be on the end cap or just on the top shelf, right? A single wine versus a portfolio. Well, we started off just doing this Provence Rosé or whatever it was, uh, Pinot Blanc, but now all of a sudden you're getting other wines and you're building a portfolio. If you feel like you're going down a rack, well, remember why you started the brand in the first place. Select few or many channels. Small wineries, typically 50 states. No, no, maybe it's just five markets. Big wineries, gotta go 50 states. Maybe not. Maybe you have to do 20 at first and go to the top ones. Maybe just that's the best way to start, okay? But you have your own list. You gotta get this down. By the way, this can take a chalice of wine in one night. You can sit down if you're the brand owner and you can really figure this part out. It's not that hard. The second one is to assess. Okay, so where you are today versus where you wanna go, or where you are today versus where you want it to be. Okay, that's important, because I know I'm talking to a lot of people here that are brand owners, or have brands that are pretty mature, or starting off. And I love this, I love this quote from Albert Einstein. If you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it'll live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Now, this is from when I was a man. This is when I was in the rank and file. It was many, many times where we worked for companies who, wanted to say, we need to be the best fish on the planet, but kept on asking us to climb trees. That's right. In other words, I want you to have a high price point. I want you to have the best distribution. But by the way, go hit Costco for us so we can make our number, right? So that's, that's like asking a fish to climb a tree. It's not the best way to manage a business. So assess your business. What do I mean by that? Internal, external, and personnel. Internal. If you're setting out to be a 500,000 case brand, are you set up that way? Do you have clients in-house? Do you have the right, or we'll talk about personnel in here too, do you have the right salespeople? Do you have a salesperson that's excellent at selling white tablecloth, but all of a sudden you start asking them to sell to Harris Teeter? It doesn't work. They might be excellent at what they do, they don't know how to sell to Harris Teeter, and vice versa. You get someone who knows how to sell to Safeway, it's not gonna be great at going into Mastro's with uh, Rev Joe. So make sure that your goals match with where you're at today. Okay? And you'll see it right away. And you'll make concessions. We do it all the time. And they're great. They're going to do fine. Or a distributor's doing fine. I know it's Southern Glaciers, and we really only need a small broker there. But they're good. We're in this small house with these cool people. And we always justify because it's elite, because we have five other things that are on fire. Those things add up. And after a while, I do promise you, and I've been with these brands, so this is speaking from some experience, it does weigh down on the overall strategy it does weigh down on your goals at the end of the day, okay? Ask your fish to swim, I guess is the best way to say it. So the next one is the plan. How do we get there? Now, this is a simple one to me. Uh, just type in Mount, uh, Mount Everest in Google, right? It's so so interesting to me that how sometimes we don't plan or we over plan. I've had people, by the way, and I'll do the Mount Everest thing in a second here. I've had people look at my presentation, it was this thick. There's people in the, in the the audience here that have seen some of these and they go, yeah, it's just not there yet. You can probably put a couple more slides in there about the market segmentation. There is over planning as well, which I think is a ridiculous thing to do. You can't over plan. But 
you have to plan, or it's just a wish. All the goals and all the assessment and everything don't mean anything if you don't put a plan in place. The simplest thing is Mount Everest. If you wanted to climb Mount Everest, that's the goal. Okay, we're gonna go there. You type in Mount Everest into Google today, what maps show up? Almost every map that shows up has a line of it. Up the one face, it's got the base camps. There's a plan. Nobody starts climbing Mount Everest without a plan. You get the right people, and everybody that first day at base camp knows where they're going. And they know what's gonna happen if something hiccups along the way. It is the most ridiculously simple concept when they climb Mount Everest because it's life or death, so I guess it's important. But we have thousands of people that uh, we're responsible for, or hundreds. It's important, it's our business. We should plan just as important, just as much, and not over plan, okay? So things like building a story, plan to actually give your team the tools that they need, like building a story. Secondly, it's like training a team. Now this one is great. This I love, and I never knew this until I went from marketing to sales in, uh, in the middle of my career. Marketing people, as you can tell, I'm chatty, are great at telling stories of brands. Oh my God, the vineyard this, and it's waxy poetic, and uh, you got a dry farm, and you know, da 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 da, -da and eucalyptus, and all this great stuff, and the brand sells for $15, and you discount it to 13, but you'll make 35, and all these things, right? And the sales reps are great, and they've had some of the best in the world performing. And in the minute they hit the desk at wherever we go, everything changes. And I go out there, maybe they're nervous I'm sitting next to them, I don't know, I doubt it. But all of a sudden the story changes and it kind of goes off and they get salesy and the story doesn't wax as poetic and they're not as good. So if you deliver this material, this speech, these, these, the brand story, the pricing to a sales rep, you have to have a practice with you. You have to, right? I mean the Warriors, what, practice 99% of the time and then they play 1%? But it's funny, our, our reps play 99% of the time and practice one, maybe not at all. How do we not have them train with us? How do they not sit and give us the presentation or do it in, a, in an environment with the rest of the team? That is super, super important. I've had people learn immensely from that. So again, plan, that's part of planning to be successful. And then you gotta put KPIs in place. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit, but. You can't just send them out to the world, and, to, and it's not just sales reps, it's for your own brand as well. You have to have some kind of performance indicators in place. It can be task-based, it can be numbers-based, we'll talk about that. All right, so again, I said this is gonna get a little awkward because my fiance is in the front row here. She's my digital media director as well. <laughs> yeah, she comes cheap. Um, uh, but commit. Now this is a place where most people will fail. And Vince Lombardi, and I love this quote, I know it's cliche, Vince Lombardi, but I really thought this was one of the best things. He said some of the greatest players in the world played for him, but if they don't have the commitment, they will not be the greatest, okay? Now, I've had executives say the greatest stories. I've had winemakers make the greatest wines, but when things change, when you're at base camp two and something goes down, things change. Now, I understand as a business, and I understand as you know, we have to make decisions sometimes, it might be financial, whatever, but if you waver too much, you will lose the rest of your audience. And your audience is not just your team, it's also the retailers, it's the wholesalers, it's suppliers, it resonates. So what I mean by this is that when you put the plan in place, you have to commit to it. And I'm not saying it doesn't mean you waver off it from time to time, but you waver off it in a way that stays within the goal that you put in place to start with, or you will lose everybody. We've all worked for wineries, wine companies, that the rank and file is just like, well, I don't care really what speech Eric's gonna give us today, because it's gonna change next month anyway. Or something's gonna happen, and they're not gonna be committed to doing it. Committed, like a marketing budget. Yeah, go out and sell 100,000 cases. But how do I do that when I don't have $5,000 to spend it? That's not committing. That's not committing to selling 100,000 cases. Or how do I sell this $300 bottle of wine, Eric, if I can't travel to get to whatever it is? So you, you understand what I'm saying. So because of lack of commitment, and you know, people like Dwayne Johnson, who's been touched by an angel, he's got his committed. He is committed to making his career work. He's not just a talented guy, which was kind of up for question. He has the most committed actor in all of Hollywood, and that's why he succeeded. It's a really great story. Uh, 
execute. Okay, so now it's time to fly. Now it's hard to make decisions. It's not hard to make decisions once you know where your values are. So I love this because when you when you work for Disney or you know the famous books that are written for Disney, that when you're an employee and you learn the Disney way, then it becomes very normal to how to act when you're on stage, right? When you go out in front of customers, you feel like you're part of a culture. You feel like you're part of something that everybody's bought into. The ownership is committed to the plan. There is a plan. There is a way to treat your customers and where you, how you go to market. It's not hard to make decisions once you know what your values are. So what I mean by executing, and by the way, this is difficult after you do the first parts. This could be a little difficult, especially of an existing brand. So what I mean by that is you might not have the right people in the right place. Remember we mentioned before, you could have a white table cloth sales rep who is amazing. And all of a sudden, your goal is to sell 80,000 cases in one state. That doesn't work. Or you have, again, the apologetic, I love the apologetic wholesaler thing. I hear it so often. Yeah, my friend is uh, the head guy over in Glacier, Southern Glacier. So we're going to keep you on this market. We're going to keep breakthrough. When you should be at a smaller house or be with a broker because your brand is a more hand sell. And it's just it's going to get lost in the big brokerage houses. And I'm dealing, I'm dealing with that today, too. Yeah. We know that guy in Texas is cool. Well, but the brand's not being sold the right way. But it's being sold. So it's other states that we got to fix. No. You have to execute to the plan. You have to replace people or partners. And by the way, that also means retail retailers. If you are not making a lot of money by the glass and you have to go buy the bottle, then you have to come to grips that the volumes are going to dip. You've got to back out of the bottle, buy the glass, raise a price and go buy the bottle and commit to the team that you're gonna say, we don't need to go from 50 to 80,000 cases while we take all that away from you. Because the team will be like, well, that's, that's not gonna work. You say, oh, listen, we might dip in volume for the first year because our strategy is to be more profitable by the glass, so our volumes are gonna go down, but it's gonna be better overall, better brand equity, more profitable for the brand, and as a team, we're all gonna be in this together. So that's what I mean is that you have to uh, make the changes that sometimes are not popular decisions, and you have to measure them often. We keep talking about KPIs or however you measure, however you want to do it. There's Salesforce, you know, you could use technology for that. You could have monthly check ins, you could have weekly check ins. I do ask of you, though, to not bury your sales reps in paperwork or, or uh, processes. are very difficult. As much as you can automate as possible, that would be great. Your sales reps are hired to do one thing, it's to hunt, and if the hunter is in the back, had, you know, counting how many deer they get all the time, that, that doesn't work, or the quality of deer your hunter is supposed to be out hunting. You should have other people assessing where your business is that can uh, take your hunters and keep them in the field, okay? And the last thing is managed by doing. Okay, well, if I got one lesson, and I got a lot, right? But if I got one lesson from being in sales for so long, is that, and, and by the way, this is across the board, I represent a 100, 100 point Parker rated wine right now that's allocated in the Napa Valley Hills. And I've also been part of Kendall Jackson where it's five million cases of wine and on, on top and in other brands that, that didn't do so well. But this is across the board, across the board. You have to manage by doing it yourself. And I did learn this from Jess Jackson actually. Where possible, you are in touch with the customer. Where possible, you're the lead, okay? To, to unleash a brokerage or a wholesale network and say, go sell all my wine, and I, I really believe this strongly. And to have sales reps that only manage wholesale and broker, you will get that at the end of the day. You will get maybe some great sales. And I understand sometimes it's not easy because you don't want to have a huge sales team. But you have to manage by doing. You have to go out there and do it yourself. And let's say you have a small team. I have a very small team now. Well, then in California, we're going to know the top 100 places that sell $800 to $1,000 bottles of wine. We are going to know the owner. We're going to know the cut the buyer. And we are going to be in touch with them. And we're going to have our partner help us, our brokers help us. But at the end of the day, those 100 people are ours. We can only tell the story really well. We know how to sell our brand better than anybody else on the planet. So my team needs to be front and facing. And by the way, that can go all the way up to millions of cases where you have to be uh, personal with the Kroger buyer, or whatever it is. So to manage it by doing. Now, one thing is that. Um, uh, and this is, this is a really cool example, um, is if you ever presented in front of a wholesaler before, has anybody here presented in front of a wholesaler before, or a broker? Okay. It's a great thing, I mean, especially when I had Kendall Jackson on my shirt, walk in and, and I'd say, okay, you know, 
everybody's going to listen to me. I'm the, I'm the number one brand in the country, and, every, and I walk in, and there's Gallo display behind me, and there's you know Bronco and everything else. So I'm not the most important person in the room. And I look out to this crowd, and I start giving my 15 minutes. And I again, I, I think everybody in the room is not listening. And the people here have done this. You know, the, the, the laptops are up, reps kind of move in that A1 quadrant. They're like butterflies all over the place. But there's always a couple people that listen. And by the way, this, this also happens for your big buyers and retailers too. If there's an assistant buyer that's listening, asking questions, that's the person you or your team attach yourself to. And that, this is really, really important. So if you go into a big wholesale meeting or a small broker meeting, if there's one person that listens to you, then you ask your sales rep, Spend 90% of the time on that one person. That one person will do most of the sales, most of the work for you, and you'll have your champion inside. Uh, instead of trying to you know, spread out across everybody. Everybody else you lost when you're in the room anyway, they'll hit their number because they have to, but they don't really care at the end of the day if, again, my head exploded and, and uh, I got brushed off the stage. So, you're bringing them to business by having being in touch with customers, and you're ongoing, you're doing your ongoing retail management because you have to be the person that sells your brand, your wine, whatever it is at the end of the day, I don't care if it's corks, or if it's barrels, or if it's bulk wine, or if it's $300 bottle of wine, you have to have your customer network that you own. And your partners, your retailers, I mean your wholesalers and brokers come along with you and you hand them the business when you can. This is the last slide. Oops. Yeah, just run right through that, huh? Okay, so I love this slide because you know, it's Robert Mondavi, obviously. He's my mentor in the business. I had the notion that we could make the greatest wines equal to the greatest wines in the world. Great wines is equal to the greatest wines in the world. And everyone said it was impossible. Now, obviously, he did a great job proving that. But what, what is he doing in this one slide? So, this guy was greatest wine sales person. The first to bring people to his winery, direct sales as well as retail sales. He's the greatest wine salesperson to ever revolutionize our business. And he started Madavi when he was in early 50s, and he became one of the most significant figures in wine. I got the opportunity to meet him um, and Peter Madavi one day. Peter is a brother that just passed away. So just a two-minute story, and we'll, uh, we'll move on here. I was at the Napa Valley auction, and something happened where I was just with the two of them, and the, they were supposed to go up on stage, and everybody dissipated, so it was just the three of us. And it was 20 minutes, 30 minutes of just me and the Madavis. Now Robert was kind of near the end of his life. He was in a wheelchair at the time. And we were chit-chatting about a few things. Peter was a little bit more conversational. And I looked at Robert and said, so tell me, you know, I'm kind of an up-and-coming guy in the business. I'm across the valley at Mom, and he loved Mom, you know. Um, and I said, tell me what, what's the one word of advice you can give me? And he goes, never. He just looked at me. He became very clear. He goes, never forget why you got into the business in the first place. Never forget, because I did, you know, and the stories we all know, he went public or we got big, whatever it is, right, launched Woodbridge, whatever the things he wanted or did not want to do. He goes, things will happen in your career, but you cannot forget why you got in the business in the first place. So I'm gonna give you the secret of sales. The one secret that I got from Robert Wendabi himself is that when I go out um, and I'm in front of a customer, if it's one person at the Pebble Beach Properties or if it's Alan Cook, who's no longer a Kroger, but was him, and he's got, he can make or break my whole year. Whenever someone talk, hears me talk about wine, I love wine. Everybody in this room loves what we do. It's amazing. Our careers are incredible. And I don't care if it's winemaking, viticulture, sales, what we do brings joy to people's lives at the end of the day. People don't need to drink our wine to survive. I like to believe that they do. But so if you have that love in your heart, and if you have that in your heart when you go out and sit in front of a Kroger buyer and he's blowing you off for 15 minutes or the wholesale network, I promise you, you will be the same greatest sales rep. Regardless of all the planning, right? you will also have the greatest team because they will believe in you and they will follow you like we all did with Robert Mondavi because when he talked, you can see it in his eyes and you can see it in the way he acted. So that's the secret of sales. Throw away everything else I just said. Just have love in your heart for wine and everything will be great. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for indulging me. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Hess. Thank you.